You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. Hello, and welcome to episode 360 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Juneteenth is a holiday that celebrates and commemorates the end of slavery in the United States. We choose to reflect on the end of slavery in the United States on June 19, because on June 19, 1865, United States General Gordon Granger issued his General Order No. 3 in Galveston, Texas, informing Texans that all slaves are free. Now, the way we study historical periods may make Juneteenth feel like it's a mid-19th century moment a moment that is beyond the scope of Ben Franklin's world. But the end of slavery didn't just occur on one day or at one time. It didn't even just occur in the mid-19th century. The fight to end slavery was a long process that started during the 17th and 18th centuries. Kiara Singleton is the executive director of the Royal House and Slave Quarters in Medford, Massachusetts. She's also a historian who's finishing her doctoral degree in American culture at the University of Michigan. Kiara and her colleagues have spent years researching the lives of the enslaved people who lived and worked on the royal plantation and the significant contributions those people made to ending slavery in Massachusetts, which was the first state in the United States to legally abolish slavery in 1783. Now, during our investigation of slavery and freedom in Massachusetts, Kiara reveals the story of the royal house and slave quarters and why it is such a unique historic site details about the royal plantation and how it operated, and what we know about the enslaved people who lived and worked on the royal plantation and the important roles they played in creating and seeking freedom in revolutionary Massachusetts. But first, a historical note. Our friends in Vermont like to claim that their state was the first to abolish slavery. On July 2nd, 1777, Vermont's legislature declared slavery illegal and abolished it. However, In 1777, Vermont was not a full-fledged state or colony. In the 18th century, it was known as the Hampshire Grants, an area of land that was legally claimed and governed by both New Hampshire and New York. In fact, Vermont became a state within the United States only after New York agreed to relinquish its claims to the region in February 1791. Now, this historical note is not to diminish the work that Vermont did to abolish slavery. It's just meant to point out that there's a technicality here that when Vermont abolished slavery, it was not, in fact, a state within the United States, and that its abolishment of slavery was not entirely legal either, given that it was in a state of legal and territorial limbo. This is why Massachusetts gets to claim that it was the first state to formally and legally abolish slavery. So there's a bit of extra history for you, and yes, we should definitely do an episode about Vermont and its interesting path to statehood soon. Okay, Are you ready to travel back in time to 18th century Massachusetts? Let's go meet our guest historian. Our guest is the executive director of the Royal House and Slave Quarters in Medford, Massachusetts. Her research expertise is in American slavery, with a focus on Northern slavery and Black women's history. She's presently working on her doctoral degree in American culture at the University of Michigan. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Kiara Singleton. Hi, it's so nice to be here. So Kiara works for the Royal House and Slave Quarters, which is a very unique historic site. It's located in Medford, Massachusetts, which is just a few miles north of Boston. And it is one of the only remaining historic sites in the North American Northeast with freestanding slave quarters. Kiara, Would you tell us about the Royal House and Slave Quarters and the story behind this historic site? Yes. So the Royal House and Slave Quarters comes into being because of the royal family. Isaac Royal Sr. moves his family from Antigua to Medford in 1732, and he brings with him 20 enslaved Black women, men, and children. And over the course of 40 years, we know that this family enslaves about 60 people. And we imagine that that number is actually much higher, but that we have only been able to find the names of 60 people and historical records. 
However, what makes us really unique is that we don't only tell a local story of slavery. We can actually tell a national and global history of slavery based on studying the royal family and the people they enslaved. More importantly, our museum and our mission is really to speak as little as possible about the royal family and really bring the stories to the forefront about the Black women, men, and children who were compelled to labor for the royal family members and who really are responsible for building their exorbitant amount of wealth. So it's extremely important to me that whenever anyone comes to the site, that they, one, know that it is a site of memory, that we're there memorializing the people who were enslaved on the plantation, and then two, that we are able to build out the worlds in which enslaved people live through archaeological evidence and historical research to really start to give texture to the stories of the people who were enslaved by the royal family. When we've spoken with other scholars of slavery, specifically slavery in the North American Northeast, they've indicated that enslaved people typically lived in their enslavers' homes, but the royal house has these freestanding slave quarters. When we come visit the royal house, Kira, what will we see? Could you give us the layout of what we'll see and tell us how this house came to have freestanding slave quarters? I mean, that's really unusual for New England. Great question. It's also one of the things that I love showing people when they come to visit the site. So when you walk onto the property, it was once a part of a 500 acre plantation. So it was quite vast in the 18th century. It occupied almost all of South Medford. So the thing about it now is that we only have about an acre, a little less than an acre of the plantation that remains, which is where the slave quarters and the big house is on. So when you walk into the property, the first thing that you see is the slave quarters. And when you walk towards the back of the property, the three-story colonial Georgian mansion, which is also the big house, comes into view. But actually, the big house and the slave quarters are about 35 feet apart. So they're very close in proximity. And the reason why I said that I actually love this question about why there is a freestanding slave quarters is because while there is a freestanding slave quarters, the big house is also a slave quarters. So one of the things that happens is that based on the 1739 inventory that is done of the property when Isaac Royal Sr. passes away, we know exactly what is in every single room based on the probate inventory that's done. On that probate inventory, it lists that at least eight enslaved people slept in the house. So we know that five slept in the kitchen. We know that two slept in a bedroom upstairs. And there's one that's listed in the spinning garret in the attic on the third floor. So the big house is also a slave quarters, but we also do have a freestanding slave quarters. But that actually gets built later on the property. It gets built around 1760. And we believe that Isaac Royal Jr., who inherits his father's estate once he dies, expands that slave quarters based on archaeological evidence. It dates it back to around 1760. It was once an out kitchen that would have been used during the hottest months to cook. So very similar to what people would see in the Caribbean, not in New England. But then they add a clapboard structure on which actually provides more space for enslaved people to do their daily tasks. And then we also know that there would have been sleeping quarters for enslaved people at the top floor of that building. And so a part of that story is actually an interesting one. We don't think that Isaac Royal Jr. just expands the slave quarters, expands the out kitchen in order to have a full slave quarters for no reason, or just because he needs more space for enslaved people. We think it's also a little bit complicated based on enslaved resistance happening around the area. So in 1755, there's a famous case, the Mark and Phyllis case, two enslaved people who are sentenced to death for poisoning their enslaver. Phyllis is burned at the stake and Mark is gibbeted in Charlestown. So we believe that the royals were probably spooked by that. They were spooked by the fact that enslaved people had such access to them. And I'm imagining that that case would have really been one of the reasons why they wanted to get enslaved people out 
of the main house and into their own living quarters. And I think that goes to talk about the intimacy of slavery. Enslaved people are sleeping all over the place on that plantation. They're sleeping in the main house. They're probably sleeping in outbuildings on that plantation as well. So while it is important for us to have that freestanding slave quarters, that enslaved people were at one point living with the royal family members as well. You mentioned as we started talking that the royal family had a plantation on Antigua. And there I can see them growing coffee or sugar or some other cash crop where they're making lots of money. But when you say the word plantation and you try to map out this sprawling piece of land over suburban Boston, which I actually think we can't do today because in Massachusetts parlance, that whole area is so thickly settled. But even if we could picture the royal's 500-acre estate sprawling over most of Medford, colonial New England was just never a place where you could grow cash crops. So Kira, what were the royals and slave people growing? Yeah, it's one of those things that people are always, when I say plantation, they go, wait, what? And I think it's really important to not call it a farm or just an estate because it is a plantation. They are enslaving Black women, men and children who are doing the labor of that plantation. Now, what's interesting about the royals and this plantation is that they are not necessarily growing cash crops in order to make money in Massachusetts. What's really growing in abundance, actually, on the plantation, there are two different types of hay, salt marsh hay, upland hay. Upland hay would be most likely used to feed the different animals that were on the plantation. The livestock actually accounted for a huge portion of what was on the plantation. And then salt marsh hay, that would have been used for mulch for the different gardens on the property or even to stuff pillowcases and things like that. But the reason why they have this vast plantation is it is in many ways a vanity project for the royals. They have amassed an extreme amount of wealth and they moved to New England And they really want to show it off. And what better way to show it off than acquiring this property that has connections to John Winthrop and his Ten Hills Farms, which he gifted himself when he was governor. And so a part of this is not that they are actually growing and selling cash crops, but really a way for them to show off the exorbitant amount of wealth that they have accumulated from their sugarcane plantation in Antigua. And so it's interesting to think about why they have so much land, but it makes sense in the context when we understand the fact that Isaac Royal Sr., he grew up to parents who were not super wealthy, and they originally lived in Maine, and then they moved to Dorchester. So he didn't grow up with a lot of wealth, and he did what a lot of white colonists did at the time was he went and made his money in the business of slavery through trading and sugar, rum, and enslaved people. And then he came back to Massachusetts to show off the fact that he was one of the wealthiest people to live in the area. Another aspect of plantations that we should talk a bit about is that a sugar plantation wasn't just a field where you grew and you cut sugar cane. The plantation was also a place where you refined that sugar cane into sugar. And a tobacco plantation wasn't just a field where you grew tobacco leaves. It was also a place where you dried and processed those leaves. So were there any other industries going on on the Royal Plantation when that very short growing season in New England came to an end? You do have enslaved people who are doing a lot of domestic labor for the royal family members. And I think some of the work that they're doing is not often what we associate with slavery in Massachusetts. So, for example, the royals, they have cows, sheep, goats, pigs. They have an orchard. It is a working farm in many ways. But one of the other things that they have is a woodlot. And that is actually not on the plantation. It's further away in what is now considered Arlington. And so enslaved people would have had to go to the woodlot, cut down the wood, make sure that they had enough logs for firewood and to bring it back to the plantation so that they could heat the home. There are other different industries, such as the royals are always looking for enslaved people who can work boats. 
And we imagine that they're doing some work going up and down the Mystic River, which is not too far away from the plantation. In fact, there is an ad that Isaac Royal Jr. places in one of the local newspapers looking for an enslaved man who we assume could work a mud boat. In that time, they would have also been called lighters. And we know that other enslaved people, such as a man named Fortune, would have been sent to town to do shopping for the royals. So we have a note in which Fortune was sent to buy beef. And so, again, while we don't have the same type of slavery that is associated with the agricultural South, I think that there's still a lot of work that is happening on this plantation that allows us to see how the royals are utilizing enslaved people to supplement and to support and sustain their day-to-day living. In terms of the enslaved people who were performing this vital work to sustain daily life on the royal plantation, you mentioned that when the royals moved back to Massachusetts from Antigua in 1732, that they brought with them 20 enslaved people. And that by 1775, by the time of the American Revolution, the royals' record books reflected that they'd held an estimated 60 people in enslavement over their 43 years living at this plantation. Do we know any of the details about the lives of these 60 people who lived and worked at the Royal Plantation over these 43 years? Almost always, we assume there are always more enslaved people on the plantation, but for whatever reasons, they're not recorded in the records or both Isaac Royal Sr. and Isaac Royal Jr. are undercounting the amount of enslaved people that they have in order to evade taxes. But we do know quite a bit about a few of the enslaved people. I was mentioning earlier how Isaac Royal Jr. advertises for a man who can work a mud boat. One of the things that we found recently is that one of the enslaved people, Plato, died while washing a horse in the Mystic River. And this story is really fascinating for me, mostly because we knew that Plato had died based on the Medford Vital Records, but we had no idea how. And so when you get into some of these stories by doing more research, You can kind of see the ways in which enslaved people's worlds are broadening. We can find out a little bit more based on this court case. And the reason why we know is because Isaac Royal Jr. is trying to get money to replace Plato. And so that's how he enters the court records. So we have that story of Plato, which is new and that we just learned. But we have other stories based on some of the enslaved people. We know that when the Royals first move over in 1737. They bring with them 27 enslaved people, but there's one group of people that's an entire family. It's Abba, Cuba, and also several siblings. That story is really fascinating to me, too, because we then know that Cuba ends up moving over to Cambridge to live with the Vassal family when Penelope Royal marries into the Vassals. I mentioned Fortune how we know that he goes shopping for the royals. He's enslaved on the estate, and that's from a receipt that we found. And then one of the people who we know the most about is Belinda Sutton. Yes, we will get to the story of Belinda Sutton because she was such a fascinating person who did important things. But first, I heard you mention the vital records of Medford Court, court records and receipts. Would you tell us more about how you're piecing together the lives of the people who lived and worked on the Royal Plantation. It's really hard to build out the worlds of enslaved people, mostly because we don't have a lot of records that are from them or left by them or written accounts or journals or diaries. So oftentimes, in order to do this work, we have to look at records that are coming directly from the enslavers And they are only really writing down things that are useful to them and not necessarily really about the people who they're enslaving. And then the other way that we're building out the research is through doing archival research. So, you know, the vital records, going through and looking for account books, being able to search historic newspapers and find any mentions of enslaved people or even the royals and who they're advertising for in terms of buying and selling enslaved people. The other way that we're piecing things together is by doing research into the people who would have been doing business with the royals. And that's been actually really helpful for us because sometimes what we can't find in records that are directly related to the royals, 
we might find in records that are related to people who they're doing business with, other family members, for example. And so then that way we can kind of see how people are moving. And one thing that I like to say is that slavery is a mobile institution. So enslaved people are all over the place, but it is just a piecing together. It is looking in court records. It's looking in almshouse records. It's looking in a lot of different secondary sources as well to try to figure out who's mentioned and how we can tell their stories. Then there's the issue that the records fail us. In many ways, we can't get to the interiority of enslaved people in the way that we want to. We want to know about their inner lives, but the records don't always account for that. And at some point, too, we should ask ourselves whether or not enslaved people wanted us to know everything about their interior lives as well. So in order to kind of build out some of their stories, we've also been using our archaeological evidence. That has been one of the best ways that we kind of get to a little bit more about enslaved people's day to day on the plantation. And an archaeological dig was done on site between 1999 and 2001. And it unearthed about 65,000 fragments of archaeological evidence that we've been using to reinterpret the stories of the royal plantation and how enslaved people live there. We'd love to know more about this research that you're doing. We'd really love to know more about the archaeology research that has revealed tens of thousands of items and what those artifact findings are revealing about the day-to-day lives of the people who lived at the slave quarters and worked on the royal plantation. It's so hard to talk about it without seeing it, but I'm going to try to set the scene for you all. So when you step onto the plantation, the first thing that you encounter is the slave quarters. And what you see is there's a garden in front of it, a lawn that's in front of the slave quarters. So when the archaeologists did their dig, one of the spots was right in front of the slave quarters. What they uncovered from that dig was really, really monumental for us. They uncovered clay marbles. They uncovered clay tobacco smoking pipes. They uncovered game pieces that were fashioned out of tile. All of these different items that not only allow us to think about the labor that Black people were compelled to do for the royals, but also the fact that it's a reminder, enslaved people, they made a life for themselves in the midst of slavery. They had families. They had kinship ties. They played games with their family members. And they did so outside of the watchful eyes of the royals. So the other special thing about where these items were found is that if you were standing in front of the slave quarters, you cannot see anything that's happening there if you were in the big house in the back. So it also allows us to think about how privacy is being negotiated by enslaved people. Obviously, they work the land. They know this land. So they know where they can and cannot be seen. Now, it's slavery, so you cannot escape surveillance completely. But these items tell us that enslaved people knew where they could have those pockets of privacy and they seize them. And I think that those items, the marbles, the tobacco clay pipe, the game pieces really does give us a little bit of insight into their worlds, what they did when they were not working on the plantation, when they had some time to themselves, how they spent that time. One thing that scholars like Jared Hardesty, Wendy Warren, Andrea Mosterman, and Nicole Myskill have told us about slavery in the Northeast is that it was often a very lonely place for enslaved people. That in the Northeast, you're talking about people who may have had one or two enslaved people living on their property and that their nearest neighbor might not have been someone that was right next door. But here you have the royals who, at some point in time, had at least 27 enslaved people living on their plantation at one time. So Kira, would you tell us about the community life and relationships and family life that the royal plantations enslaved people were able to create that may have been special because other enslaved people live too far away from each other? We imagine that enslaved people would have been able to create communities. Here's another issue about the records. We don't have records that tell us necessarily how people are building those communities, but one has to imagine that they do exist. And so thinking about enslaved people at the end of the day, 
going to the garden and sitting down and smoking and talking, talking about their life, talking about maybe what they would have experienced at church, maybe talking about what they seen when they went to the market or when they were working by the river, I think allows us to think about community ties. But also there's another thing that happens. Because slavery is a mobile institution and people are moving all around, they're encountering a lot of different people. So one story that I think is really interesting is Fortune, who I mentioned, appears on a receipt because he went to go buy beef and a few other goods for the royals, also becomes one of the co-founders of the Prince Hall African Lodge in Boston. So one might think about the different people he might have encountered on his different journeys to the market, the type of conversations he might have overheard, and then what he did once he got his freedom. And I think that that is really significant there. And to go back to your original point about the fact that there were so many enslaved people at one time, initially when the royals moved, I also want us to remember that they're constantly buying and selling people. So there is family separation and kinship ties that are being severed at all times. At one point, we know that at least several of those enslaved people leave with Penelope Royal and they go to Cambridge. And Medford is a suburban area now. It is highly developed. But imagine getting in between Medford and Cambridge in the 18th century. What would take us 20 minutes in a car now would be quite far in the 18th century because it's rural. And I think that's the other thing that's interesting about Medford. Medford was rural in the 18th century, and it was actually a place where enslavers and other people who had extreme wealth went to summer. That is where they had second homes oftentimes. So I do think there still would have been a level of loneliness there for enslaved people, but also there's isolation. Now, if you have 500 acres of a plantation, you are also quite isolated from other people. And we know that there are other people who are living in Medford at the time, but it's going to be quite spread out. So you're also encountering people when you are going into the town, when you are doing different labor by the river or wherever else you're being sent to do labor for the royals. So I think that that also puts that into perspective as well, that enslaved people would have formed a community, but they also would have constantly negotiated new people coming in all the time. The other way that they would have formed community is also church. We do know that some of the enslaved people would have attended church with the royals. And the reason why we know that is because we do have baptism records for some of the enslaved people. So we know that Belinda and her children were baptized at the First Church in Medford. So that would have been another place where they would have been able to build community with people who were not only enslaved by the royals, but other free and Black people who were in the town as well. We know that there was a lot of strife during the American Revolution, and that the revolution was also a time where enslaved people in Massachusetts and elsewhere started to think about and question the contradiction between slavery and freedom. We also know that by 1770, Isaac Royal Jr. was the largest enslaver in Massachusetts. This meant that he held more people in bondage than anyone else in the colony. And we also know that Isaac Royal Jr. was a supporter of the British crown. So Isaac Royal Jr. was an out and proud loyalist. And we also know that Boston, just a few miles down the road from the Royal Plantation, was staunchly revolutionary. Kira, do we know anything about whether the Royals enslaved people thought about the American Revolution? And if they did, Do we know if and how Isaac Royal's political views may have informed their political views about the revolution? So we don't necessarily know that outside of the fact that we do know that Fortune goes on to co-found the Prince Hall African Lodge. So that lets us know right there that he had quite the revolutionary ideas. And we can imagine and situate him within a group of Black abolitionists. And I know we're going to talk about Belinda Sutton in a little bit, but when we get into her petition, she also has quite revolutionary ideas, all of which is grounded in freedom. 
So the one thing that I'll say is that Black people always knew that they were not supposed to be enslaved. They always knew that they were free and were always in a process of trying to seize their freedom back in many ways. And so while we don't have a lot of records that will really get into that story, I'm also resisting the urge to tell about the new research that we're doing that's in process. But what I will share just a little bit of is that the enslaved people are going to pop up in all types of records. Some are going to pop up in military records. Some are going to pop up in almshouse records. We also know that the people who were enslaved by the royals are, in fact, politically active. We also know that they are negotiating the same types of conditions that Black people who live in Massachusetts during the Revolutionary Era are negotiating. And that is that even once you get your freedom, it is not completely free. You're still negotiating racism. You're still negotiating a lack of stable employment and housing. And that will lead us into all different types of issues that some of the people who we know are still living will then kind of run into. Other than that, I think that Fortune and Belinda are really good examples to say that people not only wanted their freedom, but they then went on to participate politically in advocating not only for themselves, but for others. Now, three days before the battles of Lexington and Concord, on April 16, 1775, Isaac Royal and his family fled Massachusetts and headed to England. Kara, what impact did the royal family's departure have on their enslaved people? We know that some loyalist enslavers took their enslaved people with them, but others also left them behind to protect their property during the American Revolution. So what was the story here with the royal house and plantation and the enslaved people who worked and lived there? What happened to them when the royals left? It's very fascinating because we have these letters in which Isaac Royal Jr. is writing back from England saying, hey, can you sell this enslaved person? Can you sell this enslaved person? Because I don't have as much money as I'm used to having and I'm sick and I need help. And I like to start there because my question has always been, why would he assume that once he absconds the property, that most of the enslaved people would just stay on the plantation? In fact, we know that most of them most likely left. We know that Belinda's in Boston. We imagine a few other people are in Boston. We do know that one enslaved man, George, is at least living in Medford. We don't know necessarily if he's on the plantation, but one of the letters that Isaac Royal Jr. writes actually says, can you sell George? And then we know that George actually dies in the vital records in Medford. So he was never sold. But I think it gives us a little insight that some people are still in Medford and then we know others are in Boston. But I think what's fascinating about that is that it brings us to this moment where we're having all these contestations around freedom. And there is an assumption that everyone is on the same page about what freedom is, but actually they're not. Isaac Royal Jr. thinks that regardless of what is happening with this war, whether you are a loyalist, whether you are a patriot, that slavery is going to be the law of the land for the most part. And he thinks that his rights as an enslaver is protected. And so he's writing these letters asking the administrator of his estate to sell people who, once he left, they left. Because why would you choose to remain on that plantation? We don't have any records that he left anyone behind to protect the estate. What we do know is that the estate is confiscated right after Isaac Royal Jr. flees, and it's used as the base of operations by Generals Lee and Stark. So any type of rule that Isaac Royal Jr. would have hoped to maintain over that plantation no longer existed anyway. And one of the things that we are trying to figure out is what happened to the enslaved people that were left behind. It is a possibility that some of them could have stayed on the plantation. They would have been paid for their labor that they did, but we don't have those records yet. We're in the midst of doing a pretty big research project. So hopefully we'll be able to talk a little bit more about that soon. What about self-emancipation? You mentioned Isaac Royal Jr. assumed that all his enslaved people were staying on his plantation, but we know that a lot of people left and moved away. They self-emancipated. They declared freedom for themselves. Was there a formal process for their declaring their self-emancipation, for declaring their freedom? Or 
Was the act of declaring their self-emancipation more like, I'm leaving this property and I'm moving someplace else? I think it's, I'm leaving this property and I'm moving somewhere else. (laughs) Boston has always had a free Black population. So it's quite easy to leave and go slip into that free Black population. And I imagine that is what some people did. And what's interesting is I'm just going to give a tiny example from Belinda Sutton is that she appears in Isaac Royal Jr.'s will when he dies in 1781. And he gives her the choice to either be free or to remain enslaved and to be enslaved by his daughter. Obviously, she does not choose to re-enslave herself because she's living as a free woman already on her own. So I think Black people could just self-emancipate by self-emancipating. But there is a long history in Boston of Black people utilizing the courts through freedom suits to also emancipate. So I don't want to say that there is no other legal process, but I think for the royals and the enslaved people on that plantation, once Isaac Royal flees and goes to Nova Scotia, I think they go, well, I guess we're free now and we're leaving. Well, it took us some time to get here, but we have arrived at the perfect opportunity to learn more about Belinda Sutton and to talk more about the legal processes that enslaved people in Massachusetts used to seek their freedom and even some recompense for their enslavement. But let us let this perfect moment linger just a little bit longer so we can take a moment to thank our episode sponsor. This year, our 4th of July special isn't just a special podcast episode. It's a multimedia event. Now that we're part of Colonial Williamsburg's Innovation Studios, we're taking full advantage of our production capabilities by exploring the American Revolution from different perspectives. Our podcast episode, episode 361, features three guest historians with three different areas of expertise who will help us investigate the American Revolution and what they and other historians think we should celebrate, remember, and commemorate during the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence in 2026. The Colonial Williamsburg Digital Video team has created a unique opportunity for you to meet Thomas Jefferson and Frederick Douglass. Thomas Jefferson will offer you his ideas about freedom and independence as he reads his Declaration of Independence, while Frederick Douglass will read selections from his famed 1852 speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. Heard together, we can start to understand how Americans' ideas about freedom have changed over time and continue to change over time. Colonial Williamsburg will also feature a blog post on its website written by our very own Holly White. In her post, Holly investigates the importance of looking at the histories of early America and the founding of the United States from multiple viewpoints. Holly highlights that it's only when we look at events from multiple perspectives that we can gain a fuller, more complete picture of what it was like to live and work in early America and how so many different people contributed to the formation and evolution of the United States. And finally, My colleagues at the Bob and Marion Wilson Teacher Institute at Colonial Williamsburg have teaching materials to accompany the video, blog post, and podcast episode that we created for you. Also, thank you, teachers. Your work to teach history and civics to our children is vitally important. Thank you so much for the hard work you do. Okay, be sure you tune into this podcast and to colonialwilliamsburg.org on July 4th to take part in our special multimedia event. Kara. Would you finally tell us about Belinda Sutton and about the petition she sent to the Massachusetts General Court? Yeah, I think Belinda Sutton is extremely important for how we not only talk about slavery, but also how we talk about resistance on the site. One of the things that is amazing about Belinda is that she files a 1783 petition, but it's not a freedom suit, which is enslaved people suing for their freedom. Her petition is a little bit different. It is a pension petition in which she basically says that she was enslaved by the royals for 50 years and that she was never, ever able to enjoy any of the wealth that her labor accumulated for the family. Therefore, she deserved compensation. And so I think this case really does allow us to think about the ways in which Black women utilize the courts. And for Belinda, it becomes a way for her to not only receive the money that she needed to survive, but also to make a claim that says that she was unjustly enslaved and that her labor was stolen from her. 
And I think that that is extremely important when we're thinking about the history of 18th century and how Black women are utilizing the courts. So in this case, the Massachusetts court, they agree with her. They say, you are right. And every year they give her an award of 15 pounds, 12 shillings. But then it gets complicated. She only receives that judgment twice and then spends the rest of her life petitioning the courts to get the money that she needed to not only take care of herself, but also for her daughter. And so you see in the other petitions, most people focus on the first petition, but there are several other petitions in which she is basically saying, I want the money that you have awarded me. I want what is owed to me. And we know that she only gets it twice. And for that reason, I think it's an important moment to say that She's not awarded this money because Massachusetts goes, we agree with you. She's awarded this money in part because they wanted to punish loyalists like Isaac Royal Jr. They wanted to say there is a new government in town. Look what we can do. We can take your land. We can seize your bank accounts and we can do whatever we want. And you don't have any power here. You have no control. And the reason why I say that is because she literally does not get the money that they award her. She is consistently trying to get what is owed to her. But I think at some point, Belinda knew that she wasn't going to get that money, right? That at some point she knew that, okay, they're not going to give it to me, but I'm going to keep petitioning over and over and over again. And what I think she does is what many Black women do, but we associate it with more of a 19th century story beginning in the 19th century and moving all the way to today is utilizing the courts to leave a record behind of her life. And these documents actually give us so much insight into Belinda and her life. So we find out that Belinda is married because the 1788 petition, she says that she is Belinda Sutton. That is not what we knew from the first petition. <laughs> In 1783, actually, she signs it, Belinda, an African. And so, again, we're learning more about Belinda's life as we read these other petitions. Another thing that happens is that on another petition, someone who we are presuming is her daughter signs it, Priscilla Sutton. And so, again, it also lets us know the type of family ties that are still existing in this new post-emancipation context that Belinda is not only petitioning the courts because she needs this money and it's a form of reparations in many ways, but that she's also doing this in community. We know that Belinda is illiterate because she marks her petition with an X. So someone is helping her with these petitions. And it's most likely another Black abolitionist. Some scholars will say that it's Prince Hall, but she's also doing it probably in concert with other abolitionists, both Black and white, based on the people who are signing these petitions for her. A quick question on terminology. So when we study the early history of the United States, right, and we talk about people being anti-slavery, we're usually identifying someone who was against slavery, but they weren't really pushing the envelope, as it were, to make a big and sometimes violent demand for the immediate abolition of slavery. In the mid-19th century, we start to talk about abolitionists who were people who largely were uncompromising in their demands for the immediate abolition of slavery and who sometimes turned to violence to make their point. And I've not heard or read scholars using the term abolitionist to describe people with anti-slavery views in the late 18th century context. So I wonder if it's okay for us to talk about abolitionists in this late 18th century context. It's a good question. The reason why I use the term abolitionist, which I think is really helpful here, is that it pushes back against the notion of how people are engaging in the anti-slavery movement. In general, the story is told through white lawyers and judges and politicians who really help move the needle towards abolishing slavery. And then what happens is that Black people and Indigenous people get written out of that context. And so when we think about abolition, you're right. Most people are associating it with a 19th century framework. But actually, if we go all the way back to the beginning of the 18th century, we see that some of the earliest freedom petitions are coming from enslaved Black people beginning in 1701. 
And then not only that, they're building their own social societies in places like Boston. And so I do think that that term then becomes really appropriate, that they are part of an anti-slavery movement, but they're part of a longer abolitionist framework as well. And I think part of what gets us in trouble in Massachusetts is that then when we talk about abolition, we really talk about 19th century. And by then, Massachusetts is the cradle of liberty, right? There is no slavery technically there. So then it allows people to act as though they have historical amnesia. That, well, in the 19th century, slavery is only really happening in the South. We are not implicated. And then there's no conversation about indigenous and Black people who were enslaved in the 17th and 18th century. And so I think it's a little bit of intentionality there, right? That when we talk about abolition in the 18th century, well, we're talking about it in the 18th century because there's slavery in the 18th century. And in fact, as you said, scholars like Jared Hardesty, another scholar who's really great, Gloria Whiting, when they're talking about the legal ramifications of these movements, they are centering Black communities quite literally squarely in the middle of really pushing for slavery to be overturned. And I think that that then becomes a little different than how we associate anti-slavery movements later on. Thank you for sharing that perspective with us. Now, to return to the story of Belinda Sutton, Sutton submits her first petition to the Massachusetts General Court in 1783. And 1783 is actually a really big year in Massachusetts. So as the result of enslaved people petitioning the courts and suing for their freedom, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court declared slavery to be unconstitutional in 1783 because they found it to be incompatible with the Massachusetts state constitution. Kiara, what did this declaration by the Massachusetts Supreme Court mean for the abolishment of slavery within the state? Was there a specific day in Massachusetts where everyone who was enslaved went free? And what did this court decision mean for the royals and slave people who we've been talking about? No, there is not a specific day where everyone goes free. Although people use 1783 as the year to mark the end of legalized slavery in Massachusetts, I think people like Gloria Whiting and Jared Hardesty and another amazing scholar, Ed Bell, have really pushed back against that and said it's a myth. And it's a myth because in so many ways, there's not the judicial authority really to enforce that 1783 decision. And in fact, what we see is that although slavery is declared incompatible with that 1780 Massachusetts Constitution, slavery exists in all different types of forms. And so I think for me, I always like to say slavery is not abolished until we get to 1865. And it doesn't matter even if we're in Massachusetts. For example, one of the ways that slavery continues to happen in the state, there's a case in Roxbury. There's a young boy by the name of Dick. And Dick is enslaved, but not enslaved in the way that we think about it. He's an indentured laborer, which is in many ways slavery in another form for Black women, men, and children. So he's indentured by a man named David Greenow. And he should have been freed in 1783 based on that decision. But in fact, he is not freed until his 21st birthday. And more importantly, he was not purchased until 1785. So two years after that court decision in 1783. I use that as an example to talk about the ways in which Black people are still navigating unfreedom in so many ways after that 1783. And they are still experiencing slavery, even if it is slavery by another name. And they're not just experiencing slavery by another name either. They're also experiencing a lot of racism. Yes. Massachusetts and my hometown of Boston in particular really likes to sweep its long history of racism under the rug because we had so many abolitionists. But as you've alluded to, Kira, it was actually really hard to be a black person in Massachusetts even after this abolishment of slavery. And I wonder along those lines if we could talk more about after Massachusetts formally abolishes slavery in 1783. As you mentioned, this court ruling doesn't mean there's a day where everyone receives their freedom right away. But for those who did receive their freedom at some point on this journey, what were the opportunities that former enslaved people could embrace and embark upon once they had secured their freedom? 
I want to answer that question by just going back just a little bit, mostly because what I also want to stress, too, is that your point about the racism that existed and then continues to exist in Massachusetts today is, I think, is extremely important to think about the legacies of slavery. But one of the things that's also really interesting about Massachusetts as well in that period is that we are also talking about enslaved people who not only worked in domestic sphere, you know, outside of most people in Massachusetts, white people in Massachusetts having one or two enslaved people in their homes doing domestic labor. A lot of enslaved people worked in industries, which is quite different than a lot of other places. They're working in brick making. They're working in shipbuilding. They're working at the docks. They're working in taverns. So when we're thinking about what happens to the labor that enslaved people were doing, well, that labor still needs to get done. And so imagine the ways in which newly free people are trying to now negotiate a system in which they were compelled to do free labor in terms of all of these industries that were essential, that were quite literally essential to Massachusetts economy. Now you have to negotiate a system that only saw you as free labor. So I think that that racism is extremely important because it then leads to the fact that we see a lot of newly free Black people struggling to find places to live, struggling to find places to work, and ending up in places like the almshouse because they cannot afford to sustain themselves in this post-emancipation context. And so I just wanted to add that because I do think it is so often we still associate slavery with such a Southern context that we don't actually take a moment to think about all of the industries in urban areas that enslaved people were working that really was sustaining the economy in places like Boston in particular. And in places like Boston, in cities in general, really, we tend to think of them then and now as places where there was some sort of upward mobility, where you could go and make your fortune. Were there any chances for the formerly enslaved to go to a city like Boston and push to earn more money and realize a truer sense of freedom and perhaps even some equality? Yeah, of course. What we see is that a lot of newly free people, they are working in all different types of shops. So we know that they're being hired. We also know that formerly enslaved people are now starting schools. They're starting their own churches. They're starting their own different types for social services. So you start to get Black teachers and Black clergymen and people who are associated with different spiritual and religious practices as well. We also see that Black people are enlisting in the army. Black men are enlisting in the army, which also becomes a form of mobility because people are getting paid to do that. It is an interesting world, Massachusetts, one that is quite fascinating and it's not easy to categorize. But one of the things that I think is important is that in this post-emancipation period, you also see formerly enslaved people who also own land and they are acquiring property, which becomes a very big deal in Massachusetts. Juneteenth is upon us, and it's a day where we acknowledge and celebrate the end of slavery. The holiday commemorates General Gordon Granger's General Order No. 3 in Galveston, Texas, where on June 19, 1865, He informed Texans that all slaves were free. Kira, when you think about the role of the royal house, the stories that the royal house has to tell, and Massachusetts history, how do you think these northern stories of emancipation fit within our celebrations and commemorations of Juneteenth? It's a great question. Well, one of the things that I think is really important is that we always acknowledge that Black people have always been their own political agents that they have always advocated for their freedom, not only for themselves, but for others, and that they have always been the center of a lot of political movements that they have then been written out of, especially in Massachusetts. But more importantly, that Black people were always resisting. You can't tell me a time when slavery exists and Black people are not resisting. And so I think for me, Juneteenth is also about celebrating these long histories of Black freedom movements and Black freedom dreams. And so for me, Juneteenth is also a moment when we can think about these legacies of slavery, 
think about the long history of Black radical activism that has already existed, and then think about what is happening today for people to still advocate for freedom and equity in this country. And so I think that when we're thinking about Juneteenth, it's not only a moment to talk about this history and to talk about what does it mean to be free, but I think it is a moment for us to reflect on what does freedom look like now and to also connect with different organizations and communities that are still asking that very same question today. So yeah, I think Juneteenth is not only a moment of reflection, it's a moment of service too. And now we should move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. In your opinion, how might our understanding of slavery and enslavement in the northern colonies be different if there were more historic sites like the Royal House that had external slave quarters that had survived? I think it would allow us to confront the truth of history and to really sit with this hard history of slavery that slavery is so present in Massachusetts. And I think what happens when people come to the site, one of the things that they always say to me is, I didn't even know this existed. I wasn't taught this. And I always stop and I reflect about that. The reason why I reflect about that is because I think it's not just the Royal House and Slave Quarters that can tell these stories. I like to tell people, if you go to Faneuil Hall, you walk in, you see the plaque. It says Faneuil Hall represents the cradle of liberty. Well, Faneuil Hall is also a site of slave trading. Peter Faneuil is one of the biggest merchants in Boston who makes his wealth from the business of slavery. We know he's enslaving and trading people, as well as trading goods that are associated with the transatlantic slave trade. But it's not just the Royal House of Slave Quarters in Faneuil Hall. It's if you try to catch a train from Leechmere Station in Cambridge, well, Leechmere is an enslaver. We go to institutions such as the campus of Harvard. You might go to the campus of Tufts. Well, both of them have connections to slavery. The ball fields on Tufts was once a part of the Royal Plantation. And when you go to Harvard, they just released this great report about Harvard and the legacies of slavery. You can't talk about Harvard without talking about the history of slavery. But more importantly, when it comes to our site, Isaac Royal Jr., leaves land that goes into help founding the law school there. So again, slavery is quite literally all around us. It's literally a part of our built environment. It's a part of the institutions and streets that people walk in and walk through and walk on every single day. But it's also quite literally a part of how we understand Massachusetts as a whole. If we associate Massachusetts with only a story of abolition, then we do not talk about how Massachusetts built its wealth. We don't talk about the disposition of indigenous communities who were also enslaved. We don't talk about the Black women, men, and children who built the wealth of many people who went into the founding of early Massachusetts. And so I think if we had more slave quarters, if we had more historic markers in general, people would not be able to skirt around that history. In fact, they would have to confront it every single day Because there is not much about this place that is not connected to slavery. It's just not. And I think that that is something that I think about all the time, that when people say, I didn't learn this, it makes sense to me because it is a way that people can kind of hide their hands here, right? And then say, no, we were abolitionists here. But I always like to say, well, what were abolitionists trying to do? They were trying to abolish slavery. And all of the people in the 19th century They were not just talking about slavery in the 19th century. Many of them were also talking about the ways in which slavery still existed in Massachusetts today, the racism in Massachusetts at that time, too. So, yeah, I think it would just allow more people to remember. I think you piqued a lot of our interests. So how can we make our way to the Royal House and Slave Quarters? And do you have any recommended tour routes through the historic site or a list of things we should definitely plan on seeing during our visit? 
Yeah. So we open in June and we're open on the weekends. So one of the things that you can do is you can come in on a Saturday or a Sunday for a tour. As you are coming to make your way to the Royal House and Slave Quarters, I think being able to walk the grounds, to really stop and reflect and think about this land and who was on this land and what they did on this land is essential to me. But I think if you were venturing and before you get to the Royal House and Slave Quarters, if you wanted to visit a few other places, I would highly recommend the Medford Cemetery where it's really sweet. A bunch of middle schoolers a few years ago discovered that there were enslaved people buried there and they organized to put up a marker. I would also say venture over to the slave wall that exists in in Medford that was built by Pompey, who was an enslaved man. I would also say go check out West Medford Community Center, which is the heart of the Black community in West Medford, and it still exists today. So those are some places that I would say in Medford to go visit. And if you wanted to venture a little further out, I would highly recommend going to visit the Longfellow House in Cambridge, stopping over to the Shirley Eustis Estate in Roxbury, And then also looking at the African-American Trail Project, which is hosted at Tufts. And you can learn about Black history all throughout the state. And you can go visit some of the markers. For those of us who cannot travel to the Boston area and visit Medford in person, does the Royal House and Slave Quarters have any online or virtual exhibits or programs that we can visit and access? Yes, we often do virtual programs throughout the year where There are different speakers who come and do book talks, different artist performances, such as poetry. We have a virtual tour. And what I will do, since we are participating in the podcast, is that I will make the virtual tour available for two weeks once the episode goes live. And then anyone who's interested can take a full tour of the Royal House and Slave Quarters. That's really great. Thank you so much for making that available to us. If we have more questions about the Royal House and Slave Quarters or slavery in Massachusetts, where's the best place for us to pose our questions to you? Yeah, so you can find me at director at royalhouse.org if you want to send me an email. If you prefer social media, you can find me on Twitter at Kiera Christine, and that's spelled K-Y-E-R-A and then Christine. You can also visit our website, royalhouse.org, which has an amazing overview of slavery in the North, as well as a lot about the history of the royals in Massachusetts and also Antigua. It is a huge resource, and I really think starting there is great. And then you can also follow the Royal House on Twitter at Royal House 1737, and that is also our Instagram handle. And that's Royal with two L's. Yes. Kira Singleton Thank you for sharing with us the story of the Royal House and Slave Quarters, the stories of the people who lived and worked on that plantation, and for revealing to us some of the history of slavery and freedom in Massachusetts. Thank you so much, Liz, for having me. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Juneteenth is a holiday about celebrating the end of slavery in the United States. It's also a day where we can reflect upon our nation's history with slavery. Juneteenth is meant to give us space to think about the meaning of freedom and how Americans have understood freedom over time. When we take time to reflect upon the United States' history of slavery, we will recognize, just as Kira pointed out to us, that the path to freedom, the path to abolishing slavery within the United States, was not a single event, but a very long journey. A journey that included the work of white anti-slavery advocates and abolitionists, and also of black anti-slavery advocates and abolitionists. As Kira noted, Our focus on 19th century white abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison, John Brown, and Harriet Beecher Stowe really turns our attention away from earlier attempts to end slavery and the day-to-day work that Black people like Fortune and Melinda Sutton did to resist their enslavement and to write the petitions and lawsuits that really pushed Massachusetts to expand its definition of freedom and to question and end the practice of slavery. Now, the end of slavery in Massachusetts did not happen overnight. As Kara mentioned, there wasn't a single day after the state's Supreme Judicial Court abolished slavery when everyone who was enslaved in the Bay State went free. In fact, many Bay Staters were reluctant to free their enslaved people. So some worked the legal system to keep their enslaved people in bondage for as long as possible, while others attempted to mitigate their financial losses 
by selling their enslaved people across state lines where slavery was still legal. And for those who did receive their freedom at some point after 1783, life was often challenging. Black people faced discrimination in early Massachusetts. It took some people a long time to find a job or to find housing. And many freed men and women often found themselves in precarious economic positions, as evidenced by the number of people we can find on almshouse support rolls. And if free black men and women did find jobs or housing, it's likely they found their wages well below those for white workers and their rents much higher for less living accommodations than white people would pay. So the end of slavery did not always mean freedom, nor did the end of slavery mean equality. Obtaining freedom and equality has been a long journey, and one that many consider to be incomplete today. Look for more information about Kiera, the Royal House and Slave Quarters, plus notes, links, and a transcript for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash three six zero. Please tell your friends and family about Ben Franklin's World. After all, friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. Production assistance for this podcast comes from my colleagues at Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. Joseph Edelman, Holly White, Taylor Fisher, and Ian Tonat. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, what other areas of slavery and freedom would you like to know more about? Are you interested in more stories about the enslaved? What slavery and freedom were like in different states or regions? Something else? Tell me. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios.